morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about water. Topic for the day is going to be wastewater and non-chemical pollutants. So like always, let me get you some objectives. I won't get going. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe various types of non-chemical water pollutants. So for the first couple of videos in the series, we talked about water. We talked about ways that humans use water. For the next couple of videos, we're going to be talking about ways that humans harm sources of water. So today we're going to be looking at some non-chemical pollutants. First one I want to talk about is wastewater. <clears throat> at its base level, wastewater is water that's produced from human activity. So this could be sewage produced from flushing a toilet. It could be gray water left over from washing or cooking. It could be the water that results from washing your dishes or your laundry. Any of that is known as wastewater. And there is something called the one source problem. I don't know if that's a real thing, but that's what I'm calling it. For a large portion of the world's population, they get their water from one source. And that one source of water is the water that they use for everything. So right there in the side view, you see a river. That river is probably the water source for people's drinking water, their cooking water. It's also probably where they bathe, where they wash their clothes, and their waste probably ends up there eventually. So in a lot of places in the world, there is this one source problem where you can only get water from one place. So that source of water gets contaminated by many different things. And as we talk about problems that are associated with human wastewater, there are three major things you need to know about. You need to know about oxygen demand, nutrient release, and disease-causing organisms. And remember, each of these is associated with human wastewater. So first, let's talk about oxygen demand. Oxygen demand is basically the amount of oxygen that organisms living in water require in order to stay alive. Now, high biochemical oxygen demand, biochemical oxygen demand is just the measure of how much oxygen the microbes in the water are using. High biochemical oxygen demand can cause dead zones. So basically, here's what happens. Uh, human wastewater ends up out in the environment. That wastewater has got nutrients in it. It's got organic matter. It's probably got human waste in it. There are microbes in water that break down that organic material. As those organisms break down that organic material, they need oxygen to stay alive. So if there's a huge source of organic material, the microbes, they, uh, they uh, reproduce very rapidly because there's lots of food and lots of nutrition for them. But as they reproduce and as they decompose the organic material, they use up all the oxygen that's in the water. If they're using up all of the oxygen that's in the water, causing high oxygen demand, then other organisms living in that area will not have the oxygen they need to survive. And this causes a situation called a dead zone, where those microbes that are decomposing the waste found in the water use up all the oxygen, which means fish and other shellfish and organisms living in the area essentially suffocate because there's no oxygen in the water. So know that the wastewater or the waste, the organic material in the wastewater, leads to an increase in these microbes, which use up the oxygen in the water, causing high oxygen demand, which can lead to the suffocation of other organisms. The next wastewater-related problem you need to know is nutrient release. So in most producing communities, and by producing communities, I mean communities that are photosynthetic, they produce their own food, the limiting factors for growth are usually the nutrients nitrogen and phosphorus. So once an environment runs out of nitrogen and phosphorus, photosynthetic organisms will usually stop reproducing or start growing more slowly or something like that. As the waste in wastewater is broken down, Nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus can be released from that waste and back into the environment. So this means that an environment that may have been low in nitrogen and phosphorus suddenly gets an infusion of these nutrients, which is great if you are a plant or an algae, but it causes a situation called eutrophication. This is where you've got too many nutrients in the water. <clears throat> and all the nutrients in the water can lead to an algae bloom, which you can see there on the right-hand side. This is a situation where algae start reproducing rapidly and cover the water. As they go through their life cycle, they're going to die off. And as all of these algae go through their life cycle and die, they sink down to the bottom of the body of water. Microbes come in, start to decompose them. And just like I just talked about with high oxygen demand, the microbes decomposing that algae use up all the oxygen in the water, leading to the death of other organisms. So connect nutrient release to nitrogen and phosphorus to eutrophication to the creation of high oxygen demand. Third problem you need to know associated with human wastewater is disease-causing organisms. And this is probably the biggest one. Maybe not the biggest one. Maybe the biggest one. Who knows? But a couple stats for you. 
one sixth of the world's population doesn't have clean water. So in a world where there are seven billion people, this is something like one and a half billion people don't have access to any clean water. Over 40% of the world's population lacks proper sanitation. So this would be sewage systems, toilets, um, basic facilities for washing hands. The biggest um, waterborne illnesses that affect the world are cholera, typhoid, and hepatitis A. All of these diseases are caused by pathogens that exist in water. All of them can be deadly. Um, they are a big deal in areas that don't have proper sanitation. So this is a big problem. And obviously for a scientist, it's very hard to test a body of water for every single possible pathogen that is in that could be in that source of water. So what scientists do is they use something called an indicator species. An indicator species is a species that when found in an area indicates that there might be other related species around. So what scientists do is if they are looking for contamination in water, they will test for an indicator species known as fecal coliform bacteria. Fecal coliform bacteria is a class of bacteria that is found naturally in the digestive tract of humans and other animals. When we defecate, the fecal uh, coliform bacteria come out. And so the presence of fecal coliform bacteria in water indicates that that water has been contaminated by human or animal waste. If a scientist finds that fecal coliform bacteria, they can infer, all right, this water has probably been contaminated by human waste or animal waste, and it's likely that it's going to have some sort of pathogen in it. So they're looking at that fecal coliform, which on its own is harmless, but it indicates that there could be other more harmful pathogens present. And one species, one specific type of fecal coliform bacteria that's looked at is the E. coli bacteria that lives in our guts. Most strains of E. coli are relatively harmless, so scientists can look for this as an indicator that there could be other pathogens present. Now shift gears a little bit away from human wastewater and talk about some other types of uh, water pollution. And these that we're gonna talk about are not um, chemical pollutants. We're, chemical pollutants are gonna get their own video later on. So we're gonna jump in and talk about some pollution that is not chemical. So the first one I wanna talk about is solid waste. And solid waste is just trash and litter that ends up in waterways. Now, most trash that ends up in the waterways is the result of either people littering or places where they do not have proper waste disposal facilities or trash blowing off of landfills or out of dump trucks. It could be water or it could be trash that is dumped by ships out at sea. Either way, this is solid waste that ends up in the water and causes a ton of problems. You can get those soda rings wrapped around the necks of turtles and birds and stuff and kill them. Um, in a lot of places, birds will mistake plastic for food and they will fill their stomachs with plastic and not be able to eat real food, so they'll die. Um, a lot of times these plastics soak up chemicals and then release those chemicals into the body of water that they're in or when fish eat those plastics they get the chemicals that were soaked up by those plastics. Um, there's the problem of coal slag which when coal is burned it leaves behind um, materials that must be disposed of. Usually they're put in a landfill but <clears throat> that slag can leach into groundwater supplies and then there's gyres. Now you may have heard of the North Pacific Garbage Patch. Basically, way back, we talked about ocean currents and how in some parts of the ocean, currents run in a big circular gyre, like a toilet bowl almost. Um, solid waste that ends up in water eventually makes it to the ocean. Once it gets to the ocean, it can get trapped in these gyres and just kind of get stuck going around and around and around. So in the North Pacific, off the coast of Hawaii, there is an area of trash about the size of Texas known as the North Pacific Garbage Patch. And this is, like I said, an area about the size of Texas that is full of all of the waste that ends up in the Northern Pacific. So when scientists go there and they run nets through the water to test for plankton, they often get more plastic in their nets than they do plankton. So be aware of the problem of solid waste. Another non-chemical problem is sediment pollution. Now sediment, like we've talked about way back, is basically dirt that comes from the breakdown of rocks. We've talked a lot about human-caused erosion. Those activities that cause erosion cause the sediment to get into water. As that sediment gets into the water, it cloudies the water and causes several. If water is cloudy, sunlight is not able to filter down through that water, which means that any photosynthetic organisms in that water will not be able to get proper amounts of sunlight in order to carry out photosynthesis. Also, that sediment that is eroded off the land can be carrying uh, pesticides and fertilizers, so that means more nutrients or chemicals that can uh, kill living organisms. 
If you are a fish and you depend on absorbing oxygen out of water and there's a ton of sediment in your water, that's going to clog up your gills, which means you're not going to be able to be able to breathe. And one term that I want you to attach to this is turbidity. Turbidity is basically how clear water is. So water that's got a lot of sediment in it is known as being turbid. Two types of non-chemical pollution to finish up. The first one is thermal pollution. We've talked about water use in industry. As water is used in industry, especially in electricity and generation, it's used to cool machines and cool other processes. As that water is used to cool those things down, the water itself absorbs that heat, taking it away from the machines. And then as that water is recycled, it gets dumped back out into the original body of water that it came from. When that water gets dumped out, it could be you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 degrees hotter than the body of water that it was taken out of. Now, remember that organisms are particularly adapted for their environment. So if you rapidly heat up the body of water, then you can get thermal shock, which is a situation where temperature changes too rapidly. Organisms that live in that environment generally die off as a result of thermal shock. Also, another problem with thermal pollution is lower dissolved oxygen. Cold water is really good at holding oxygen. Warm water does not hold on to oxygen very well. So if a body of water is heated up, then the oxygen content is going to go down, which is obviously very harmful for the organisms living in that body of water. And I want to wrap up with a type of pollution that we don't normally think of, and that's going to be noise pollution. Kind of think back in your brain to all the stuff that you've learned about whales and dolphins over time. You've probably learned at some point or in some way that they communicate and hunt and fish using sonar which is basically sending noises out those noises reflect off of whatever they've sent it to and it bounces back or they communicate using sound through the water there's a lot of things that humans produce and use at sea that produce a lot of noise so you've got ships that have got sonar that is noise being sent out to the water you've got the ships themselves that are very loud um, the Navy uses air cannons underwater, which are extremely loud. So all of these ships and sonars and communication devices and things out in the ocean send a bunch of noise pollution down into the water. And this noise pollution has been associated with a couple of things. Um, first one is mass beaching events. And these are situations where hundreds of whales or dolphins have just suddenly thrown themselves up on shorelines and essentially died there on the coast. And scientists don't necessarily know what causes it, but it's been associated with the usage of sonar devices off the coast in the ocean. So it's possible that that noise really stresses out or confuses aquatic mammals. Um, also, it's going to disrupt their communication and probably their navigation because think about it like this. If you're trying to talk in a noisy room, the person that is across from you can't hear you. And essentially, this is what happens to our marine mammals. If there are all these machines making noises out in the ocean, then they cannot communicate with each other. They're also probably not going to be able to hunt nearly as well. So that's what we've got. Lots of things that can cause water pollution. We're going to have another video on chemicals and oil and things like that. But for now, go back and review the problems associated with human wastewater. Make sure that you know these non-chemical sources of pollution that I've just talked about. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.